Amen. Good morning. Grace and peace in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. I'm so good to see all of you as we've gathered here in his name to give our worship and our praise and our thanks. I'm so glad that you're here today. Uh, those who are uh, faithful members and those who might be visiting with us this morning, um, it's wonderful to have you with us that you've chosen Mount Sylvan as your place of worship today. If you are visiting for the first time, just a reminder that we do have a red welcome bag. It's on the uh, to your left as you exit these main doors here. There's a welcome table there. It has our newsletter, has some other information about our church that might be helpful. And if you'd like a call or a visit, Pastor Kathy and I would love to um, reach out to you in the week ahead. Just let us know that you're interested in finding out more about the church, and we would love to connect with you. In your pews, you also have a connection card, and we um, ask members and visitors to fill this out each week, just a record of your presence here, but also on the back, an opportunity to put any prayer concerns that you might have that you'd like the pastors to lift up in the week ahead. Before we begin worship, I do have a few thank yous and some reminders about upcoming ministry opportunities. Uh, first, we give thanks to Carrie Stubbs and to the Beulah Cole Circle for the two beautiful flower arrangements that are given today to the glory of God and in loving memory of Joan Stubbs's birthday. Also, thank you to Priscilla Coleman, all those who uh, helped make our Red Cross blood drive on such a success last Monday. I think we had 24 donors, which is a very good turnout, and we appreciate those of you who were able to help with that. As far as some schedule reminders on Tuesday, Sylvan Seniors, uh, this week is a very special one. I believe Kent Dixon and Neil Allen will share their musical gifts, so come out and join us at 11 o'clock on Tuesday. Our weekly Wednesday night fellowship dinners, they're back. Uh, we resumed those last Wednesday, just a delicious meal and a great time of reconnecting and having fellowship with each other. Those are 5.30 to 7 on Wednesday nights, and we hope that you'll come out. You can use the Sign Up Genius to let us know that you're coming, or call the church office tomorrow and let us know that you want to be added to the list. And then don't forget Saturday, October the 5th. That's the annual Mount Sylvan United Women in Faith Fall Festival. It's 8 a.m. to 12.30 that day. It's only about 20 days away, so go ahead and put that on your calendar. Uh, there's going to be food and shopping fun and fellowship that you don't want to miss, miss. and in order for um, our United Women in Faith to raise money for missions each year, this is um, their biggest fundraiser, um, and we're asking you to help in the following ways. Um, the first one, as I said, mark the date, put it on your calendar and plan to attend, and also invite some friends and neighbors uh, to come out. It's always a great event together. And then second, uh, start baking or canning or crafting. Um, they need a variety of items. You can volunteer to donate one or more items if you're able to, uh, to um, their efforts to raise funds for missions. And then last, um, probably the most important one, is to pray about the event. For those that are organizing and coordinating it, um, those that will be making items to sell, those who will attend, and those who are in need, uh, who will be blessed by those mission funds that are raised and the donations received from our United Women in Faith. Uh, if you have questions about that, please contact Yannicka Rodeo or Jennifer Rogers, and they'll be happy to tell you more about it. Um, it's a big church-wide event, so we do want you to invite others to come out and be a part of it. And then finally, you can check out the monthly newsletter for details about our September and October Bible studies. Uh, Pastor Kathy's leading one, and I'll, eat, I'll lead one as well. And there's specifics also in the newsletter and in your pews about our new Grief Share course that will begin in October. That's open to the church and to the community if you know of others who could benefit from that course together. If you're able, I invite you now to please stand for our call to worship as we begin worship together. Holy God, love divine, yourself in part, enter every mind and heart. Abide with us this sacred hour, fill us with your glorious power. Lord, nothing more can we require, we want nothing less than you to be our heart's desire, our source of hope and peace. Amen. Our opening hymn today is, I Sing the Almighty Power of God. Let us sing together.
The peace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, be with you. Let us welcome one another and share his holy peace. As we make our way back to our pews, we're going to join together in this morning's affirmation of faith, and today we'll share in the Apostles' Creed together. Please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitted at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. congregation may be seated and we invite our children to come forward with Miss Heather for children's time. Oh, oh, good morning. Good morning. good morning. good morning. I love you guys are so excited this morning. Okay. So I have an item in this bag here. Okay. So just by looking at it, just by looking at it. Now, if you saw me put it in there, you can't guess, okay? <laughs> okay, but without knowing what's in here, can you take a guess of what you think might be in here? What do you think, Riley? The church. The church is in this bag. Okay, what else is in this bag? That's a good guess. What else, Carly? Air. air. There is maybe a tiny bit of air in there. Mm hmm. Uh, maybe. What do you think? Um, what do you think might be in here? Um, I know it's hard. Like, you want to shake it? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, with these few people here, now just hold this bag and see if you can maybe guess what's in there. You can feel it. You can shake it up a little bit. Does that help you? A pop it. A pop it. Okay, maybe. What do you think's in there? A box. A box. Ooh, he's a feeling box. a box. What do you think? A box. A box. Okay, there's a box was a good guess. All right, so now I'm going to open it and just take a peek in here. What do you think's in here? This side. Crayons. 
What's in there? Crayons. What do you call them in there? Crayons. Can you see it back there? Band-Aids. Crayon Band-Aids. Yes. And they're in a box. See? Crayon Band-Aids. Yeah. Okay. So we kind of changed our guesses as we got to feel the bag and look into the bag. So in today's scripture story, Jesus asks the disciples a question like the one I ask you. But instead of asking his disciples, tell me what's in this bag, Jesus asks them, tell me who the other people think I am. The disciples gave all sorts of answers. He's a prophet. He's John the Baptist. He's Elijah. Because there were lots of people who didn't know very much about Jesus. So I think those guesses about Jesus sound a lot like we sounded when we were first guessing what was inside the bag without ever looking inside the bag at first. Jesus then asks the disciples, who do you think I am? And because the disciples had been spending lots of time with Jesus and learning from him, they had answers that were closer to being correct. It's like the disciples had spent the time and effort to figure out what was inside the bag instead of just guessing. Today's story is a good reminder to us that learning the answer to the question, who is Jesus, is not something we learn quickly or from a distance. It takes time and investigation to learn about who Jesus is. Here are some of the ways that we can learn about who Jesus is. By coming to worship on Sunday mornings. You guys being here today, this is how we can learn more about Jesus. By reading and talking about the faith stories that are about Jesus in Sunday school. Raise your hand if we looked at a Bible story today in Sunday school. Yes. By reading a Bible story each day with our parents, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, friends, and then talking about it after we read it. When we do these things, we are like the disciples who learned about Jesus by learning from him. The more we learn about Jesus and from Jesus, the more we learn how to receive and share God's love, just like Jesus did. Can we pray about that this morning? All right, pray your hands. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who teaches and shows us how to receive and share your love. Help us to keep learning from him and about him. Thank you. Amen. All right. All right, for all of your great guesses this morning, have a couple Band-Aids. All right, here you go. Oh, you're going to need some? We got a wild one up here. All right, there you go. Hold on, hold on. All right. After Jesus asked the question about who do you say that I am, he challenged the disciples to follow him, to deny themselves, to take up their cross and to follow him. Let's sing uh, this hymn as we begin our time of prayer. Where he leads me, I will follow.
God does give us grace. And as we begin our time of prayer, let's begin with a prayer of confession. Our, our prayer today is a responsive prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, you created us to live in relationship with you and with others. You call us to follow the example of Jesus in caring for others. We confess that we have not always followed faithfully. Forgive the times we choose the safety of our own friends and do not welcome others. Forgive the times we have been too concerned with our own comfort and focused on our own happiness. We have chosen not to see the needs around us because then we would feel guilty for not doing something to help. Forgive our complacency. Forgive our excuses. Forgive our lack of commitment. Help us to turn away from all that gets in the way of our relationship with you and distracts us from hearing your voice and doing your will. I invite you to a time of silent confession. Hear this good news. We experience God's love anew as we offer love to others. We are God's children, called to be different, called to act differently. As you remember how God has forgiven us, offer forgiveness to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. We continue our time of prayer with some prayer quilts. And again, we thank the um, people that gather every week and make quilts so that we can offer these that are tangible signs of our prayers to say to someone that we're praying for them. But then when we leave a quilt with them, every time they look at that quilt, they're reminded of the prayer and the cares of this congregation. This one is for Nancy Ruth Best, who has um, had a couple of falls recently and is recovering from those. This is for Noli Apple, who is now home after being hospitalized at Duke Regional and um, trying to transition back to caring um, for herself at home. This one is for Susan Taylor. Susan is suffering from long COVID and is also continuing to seek treatment for long-term digestive issues. So let's remember Susan in our prayers and for Tom as he cares for her. This is um, for Chris Garrison in the death of his wife, Christy Garrison. Um, she died recently after a 10-year battle with breast cancer. And she was a teacher at Eno Valley School, a co-worker of uh, several people that um, are members here and a special friend of Jennifer Morton. So Jennifer would like to take this and offer it to her husband, Chris. Others that continue on our prayer list, uh, we have been praying for months for Bryant Walker who is the nephew of Susan Dunnigan. He had a liver transplant and then earlier this year a lung transplant and has really fought hard. But he passed um, away this Wednesday uh, with his family around him um, after being hospitalized for the last several weeks. Uh, John Wren is recovering from this past Tuesday's outpatient skin uh, cancer procedure. Linda Stevens, who was um, in the hospital and then at Hillcrest, is now back at home. And um, if you would like to make a visit or take a meal, uh, there is a meal plan that uh, you can sign up for if you would like to, to help provide a um, meal or visit for Linda Stevens. Susan Dunnigan and Joy Holler, Cindy Miller, Jane Sellers, and Patsy Thorne are all recovering at home after uh, recent surgeries or hospitalizations. 
Phil Browning's mother, Virginia Browning, we continue to remember in our prayers. And also for Angela Tim and James McKeon, um, the due date for their new baby was this past week. And so anytime we'll be welcoming a new uh, little girl into the McKeon family. Uh, let's pray for uh, Louise and Thomas Satterwhite. Thomas is, um, was hospitalized, has been hospitalized several uh, times in the last few months and is um, seeking a place for assisted living and is still at the VA at this time. Let's pray for Betty Mitchell, who is a Pastor Don's mother, who will have um, a procedure for spinal fracture on this Wednesday at Rex Hospital in Raleigh. We continue our prayers for Willard Flintum, Pat and Millie Jackson, David and Francis Robertson, George and Kay Tilly, Pat and Clarence Hill, Ron and Gloria Dugan, Jeff Philhauer, Kathy Bryan, Kathy Lockamy, and there are many others on our prayer list. I will give you an opportunity to name those that are on your hearts uh, later and during our time of prayer together, and we'll mail out I'll uh, email out the complete list um, so that you can continue this week to pray for them. Let's pray. Gracious God, we praise you for your faithful love, for the mercy you have shown toward us. In love, you created us, and in love, you sustain us every day, one day after another. So it is with confidence that we bring our prayers to you, knowing that you hear us and we trust that you answer in what is in your will. We pray for the world around us, for the many who continue to suffer and call out for help, for those without enough to eat in our community and around the world, for those who aren't safe because of political oppression in the countries where they live or because of domestic violence or violence here in our own community. And for those who are desperate to find work to support their families. We pray for your church around the world that we would be a living, living demonstration of what you have called us to be, offering hospitality to all, ready to help others in time of need, seeking to live in peace, and showing love not only to our friends, but also to those we don't know, and even to our enemies. God, you have called us to pray for our enemies to bless them rather than curse them, even those who deliberately seek to harm us, those who have hurt us either physically or emotionally, those who have stolen from us or cheated us of what was rightfully ours, those who have spread rumors about us. God, help us to forgive even if they haven't asked for our forgiveness. Open our hearts so that we may see them as you see them. And give us strength to respond to them with your love. We pray for our family and friends who are suffering. Those who are grieving the death of a loved one. Those who are working to overcome mental illness those facing challenges at home or at work, those who are struggling either physically or emotionally. Our needs are great, oh God. And as we are gathered in worship, we name them now before you.
Open our eyes to recognize your presence in our lives. Help these who we have named to experience your presence in their lives. Give us grace to hear your call and courage to follow without hesitation, knowing that your way, O oh God, is the way that leads to abundant life, eternal life. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come to the time in our service that we have the opportunity to give, to give to God for the many ways that he has abundantly blessed our lives, to give for the support and the ministry of Mount Sylvan Church, through the gifts to the general fund, we meet not only the needs of the church, um, the building and the staff and all of the ministries that we have, but also have the opportunity to minister to our community and to be a light here that people can see the love, the grace, and the generosity of God. I invite you to give generously. Esther, will you come forward? Oh, loving God, we bring these offerings with hearts attuned to your call. May our gifts help to bring understanding, compassion, and healing in the world. Keep our eyes open, our hearts open to the many needs all around us. We dedicate these gifts to your service and to spreading the good news of the living hope that we have found in you. 
Through Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Today's epistle lesson is from 1 Peter chapters 1, verse 3 through 7, and chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. Blessed be the, fa the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or even as a mischief maker. Yet if any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it a disgrace but glorify God because you bear this name. This ends the epistle lesson.
Come receive Christ the King. Come and live forevermore. What a beautiful anthem this morning. Thank you so much, choir. And thank you, Bill. We turn now to our gospel lesson for the morning. It's from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 37. If you're able, I invite you to please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to, to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, we have felt and heard your spirit among us and the prayers that have been shared and the music that has been shared and the fellowship that we are sharing with one another. We know that you are in this place. We ask, O oh God, that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts and minds may be acceptable in your sight. And we do pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. This morning's message is entitled, The Great Debate. And so first, let me say up front, it has absolutely nothing to do with the presidential debate earlier this week, and I know you're happy about that. Instead, it's a much more important debate. This debate between Jesus and Peter, found in today's scriptures from Mark chapter 8. It stems from a direct question that our Lord poses to Peter when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? Please think about that question for a while in our time together. And as you consider the course of your life thus far, what, what truth or what truths have you learned about Jesus that have most shaped your earthly journey? We're going to unwrap those two questions together this morning, but before we do, I want to begin on a, a more humorous note and share with you a similar question that was asked to a group of kids and teenagers. And the question was, what are some important truths that you have learned during your years on earth th thus far? I want to share their responses because they're quite enlightening. Again, what important truths have you learned over the years? And the first response is from a teenager. His name was Michael, age 13. He said, I've learned this truth. When your dad is upset and he asks you, do I look stupid, don't answer him. <laughs> and then he noted I was grounded for a week. <laughs> Amy, age 12, said, never tell your mom that her diet isn't working. <laughs> Patrick, age 7, who apparently does not like vegetables, he said, one truth is you can never hide a piece of broccoli and a glass of milk, no matter how hard you try. <laughs> Keisha, age 10, her truth was, if you really want a kitten for your birthday, start out by asking for a horse. <laughs> and then last, Anna, age eight, 
I've learned to never hold a dust buster and my cat at the same time. <laughs> my guess is that all of those kids learned those truths through their personal experiences, which is usually where the best learning happens, isn't it? Knowledge we gain firsthand through our trials, our mistakes, our challenges, through the times of suffering and uncertainty that we go through. And in this morning's gospel lesson, we see that rather clearly in this familiar passage of Scripture where Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter seems to be the only one brave enough to answer that particular question. Out of all the disciples, he responds right away, proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. Interestingly, in Matthew's parallel version of the same event in Matthew 16, 16, when asked this question, Peter says to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The right answer, of course, the long-awaited Messiah, the one that God had promised throughout the centuries, the one of whom the prophets of old had spoken, the one who would come to save and deliver God's people. That is the truth that Peter proclaims about Jesus. The truth that has begun, at least in part, to shape his life and the lives of the disciples as they have followed Jesus throughout his ministry. And now at this point in the scriptures, some were saying that Jesus was John the Baptist, come back from the grave. And others said maybe he's Elijah, Maybe he's Jeremiah. Maybe he's some other prophet here for a second time around. Some said he was just one of the wisest rabbis that ever lived. There were all sorts of ideas floating around regarding who Jesus was. But Peter, Peter the Rock, he proclaims it boldly. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. And then right after this confident answer is given, the great debate begins. This debate over just what kind of Messiah Peter really wants and what kind of Messiah Jesus really is. In detail here, for the first of three times in Mark's gospel, Jesus specifically tells his disciples, I must undergo great suffering. I will be rejected by the religious elders and the chief priests and the scribes. I will be killed. And after three days, I will rise again. That's the kind of Messiah I am, Jesus explains. But Peter says, you must not talk like that, Jesus. Immediately, Peter takes Jesus aside, and he rebukes Jesus. In other words, Peter debates Jesus about who he is and what his mission should be. Imagine that, arguing with the Lord of the universe about his identity and his purpose. And I wonder if we're ever guilty of the same, trying to fit Jesus into our desired image of him. Of course, Jesus must then rebuke, correct, engage in this debate with Peter so that Peter and the other disciples might begin to rightly understand who Jesus is. Jesus turns to all the disciples at this point, but he says directly to Peter, get behind me, Satan, for you're setting your mind on human things instead of divine things. That's verse 33. I want to stop there for a moment at that verse, because in many ways, Peter is a symbol of all of us, isn't he? Especially as we look more closely as this scene unfolds, we, we operate that way. After all, we're human. That's our automatic perspective for most things, is it not? We're flawed, and we're often worried most about ourselves. We let that tendency to, to just focus on, how is this going to benefit me, or how is this going to hurt me? We let that become the lead question for most of our interactions. And if we're honest, we sometimes see Jesus as the one who's going to support our wants, our desires, our personal views. We sometimes see Jesus as the one who will sustain only the preferences that we want to lift up and advance, even when it doesn't match with what we find in the Bible and in Jesus' teachings and his ministry on earth. And to this very point, 
To this very point, Jesus says to Peter, we must gain another perspective. We can, and we must learn to set our minds not just on human things, human wants, me first, human endeavors, but that we can also learn to set our minds on divine things. Here I believe Jesus is telling us that with his help, we can learn to focus not just on our immediate needs, our instant gratifications here on earth, but on the truth that we are here for more than just ourselves. You know, thankfully, we set aside at least an hour on Sundays to remember that truth as we worship together, that we have a holy purpose, not just a a human-driven survival of the fittest purpose for being on this earth, but a holy purpose for being here. Every one of us in this holy space. Aren't you more than just a eight to five or nine to five employee in whatever your career you're a part of? Aren't you more than just a retired person trying to live out your years in peace as healthy as possible? Aren't you more than just a consumer of whatever products that the barrage of advertisements and peer pressure convince you and me to buy? Aren't you more than your title or your degree or your race or your country of birth? Aren't you more than just a vote among millions of votes that will determine which leader of which party assumes power in the next four years? Aren't you more than just a man or woman or child or teenager who's passing time here on this earth for 80 or 100 years, and then that's it? Aren't you really here for a holy, holy purpose? To discover our holy purpose, we must first discover Jesus' holy purpose for coming to this earth. I think that's what this interaction in the gospel today is all about. Jesus asked, who do you say that I am. And if, like Peter, we say he's the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of the living God, then what kind of Messiah do we really want? Can it be one who comes to serve and not be served? One who undergoes this great suffering and rejection and is even killed on a cruel cross before he rises again on the third day? One who dies to atone for my sins and your sins and the sins of the whole world? Who do we say that Jesus is? What kind of Messiah do we want? Jesus proclaimed that he would bear the fullness of our humanity, the fullness of our human experience, including suffering and death, so that those who follow him, those who believe in him, would not perish, so that death would not have the last word for us, so that we might have everlasting life that the choir so beautifully sang about this morning. And this great and undeserved love from Jesus to us, it helps us set our mind on divine things as we gather week after week with the sign of the cross before us, that we too are more than just flesh and bone. We can live a life of giving and serving, and caring, and ministering, and forgiving, and sacrificing at least a portion of some of ourselves, and our time, and our money, and our talents, and our resources for the building up of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. You know, the good news is that we have a record here of what happened next for Peter and the other disciples. Eventually, Peter is able to set his mind on divine things, but it's after the cross, it's after the resurrection. If you recall, it's after this interchange today when Peter rebukes, is rebuked for only wanting a Messiah of his own design. It's after this scene where Peter denies even knowing Jesus three different times on the night when our Lord was arrested and beaten and tried and then soon hung upon the cross. Peter's realization finally happens on a beach at daybreak. It's recorded in John chapter 21, if we were to look there this morning, the last conversation between Jesus and Peter on earth takes place. 
And some of the other disciples were there. The resurrected Jesus makes breakfast over a charcoal fire. You remember that story. And when it was over, Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? And Peter said he did. But Jesus continues this train of thought. He asked Peter the same question three times. And of course, that's not by accident. Instead, it's so Peter may have a chance to be redeemed for that three times denial on the night of Jesus' arrest. And he can be redeemed for wanting his own version of a Messiah. Jesus says to Peter, then if you love me, feed my lambs. If you love me, feed my sheep. And from that day on, Peter did. He set his mind on divine things. In fact, Peter is the first of the disciples to perform a miracle in the name of Jesus. He heals a cripple at the gate of the temple in Acts chapter 3. He, he tells that beggar who's been crippled since birth, he says, I don't have any silver or gold, but I'll give you what I do have in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And the man jumped to his feet, and he began to walk and praise God. And later, Peter raised Dorcas, sometimes called Tabitha in the scriptures. He raised her back to life in the name of Jesus. She was the woman who had done many good works. She had cared for others, made clothing for the poor in Joppa. And it's also there in that same area where Peter was praying on a rooftop. He received a vision that God shows no partiality. Anyone who professes faith and does what is acceptable to God is welcome, Jew and Gentile, old and young, red and yellow, black and white, as we used to sing in Sunday school. All are precious in his sight. And Peter comes to that realization, and he shares it with the early church. You know, there were times when Peter, he suffered greatly for his faith in the real Messiah, times in prison, times when he was whipped and flogged, beaten and chained by the Jewish Sanhedrin, times like the one where, where Peter and John, they were both given 39 lashes, just as Jesus was, if you remember. 39 lashes with a whip, and we we're told that they received 13 on one side of their shoulders and 13 on the other side, and then 13 across their chest. And they were commanded to stop healing in the name of Jesus. Stop preaching Jesus as the Messiah crucified and risen. But just as soon as they were released, they both returned day after day to the temple, preaching that very thing. In fact, Peter was also martyred you know this part about his life. He gave his life up for the gospel, refusing to budge on the belief that Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah, the Son of the living God. The only living hope the world has ever known, the only hope the world will ever know is a source of forgiveness and eternal life. And legend has it that Peter believed so much in Jesus as the Messiah, he didn't think he was worthy to be killed in the same manner as Jesus was. He requested instead to be crucified upside down. And so as I close, I want you to hear these words attributed to the disciple Peter. It's years later, he's instructing the Christians to persevere, keep going in times of suffering, keep going in the tough times that come. It's found in his first letter to the early church that Chris read for us earlier. Peter says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, God has given us a new birth into a living hope, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God has given us this hope. It's not one of our own making. It's not one of our own design. It's not one of our own definition or one created by human hands or human rules. No, God has given us this hope through Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, our Deliverer, our Savior, our Lord. He goes on to say this gift from God in Jesus Christ is an inheritance. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's unfading. And during the second half of his life, Peter was finally able to understand that. The kind of Messiah Jesus really was. And upon Peter the rock, Jesus built the Christian church. And we're part of that great congregation of believers. 
that has lived and died in the faith generation to generation over these past 2,000 years. Believing and suffering and worshiping, debating, celebrating, striving to live out the truth of who Jesus is and in turn who we should be. You know, every day we should engage in that great debate. Not the debates that the world gets so called up in every four years, but the greatest debate. The one that will matter now and for eternity as we answer Jesus' question. Who do you say that I am? And then every new morning, we should ask, who would Jesus say that we are? Would you pray with me about that? Oh, Lord, help us to have the courage, the courage to risk being known for what we believe about you. May our words and our thoughts and our actions reveal to the world our deep faith in you and in your unending love for us. We do pray in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior, our living hope. Amen. This morning, our closing hymn is Lift High the Cross. We invite you each week, if you'd like to come, and Pastor Kathy and I will pray with you here at the communion rail. But all who are able, if you'll stand, we'll sing together, Lift High the Cross, thinking about these words as we sing. Just as Jesus called the disciples, told them to deny themselves and follow him, we are called to follow, to deny ourselves, to live like Jesus, 
to love like Jesus, to be like Jesus, to give like Jesus, to serve like Jesus. So go. Deny yourself and share God's love and grace and peace with others this week. And may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as you go. Amen.